So, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Adam Lee from Stanford University. Today, I'm going to talk about how we learn multimodal reward functions using trajectory rankings. This is a joint work with Vivek Myers, Nima Nari, and Dorsa Sarik. So let me begin with defining the standard reward learning problem. We have a user who wants a robot to perform a task, and this user has an internal reward function that he wants the robot to optimize. However, the robot doesn't know this reward function. One popular way to learn the reward function of the human is through comparisons. In this approach, the robot shows two trajectories to the user, and the user tells which trajectory they prefer. Based on their responses, the robot learns the underlying reward function. Let's consider an example scenario. Here, we have the red autonomous car who wants to make a left turn. So it starts turning, but then it realizes the blue car, which is coming from the opposite direction and was previously occluded behind the red truck. Depending on its policy, the autonomous car may make different decisions now. If it's using a reward function, it learned from comparisons made by a timid driver, the car may stop and give way to the blue car. It could avoid an accident in this way. As a second scenario, we could think of a case where the data come from an aggressive driver. In this case, the autonomous car could try to complete its turn before the blue car reached the intersection. In both of these cases, our autonomous car was using uh, the data from one of the drivers. And there have been many works around these ideas. Some of them directly learn a policy, whereas some learn a reward function that encodes the policy. What's commonly assumed is that the underlying policy, so the data, is unimodal. For example, in the driving scenario, we said the data come from one driver, either timid or aggressive. But what if the data come from multiple users who have different reward functions, and our robot doesn't know any of them? It doesn't even know who provided the data. In the driving example, this would be a scenario where the autonomous car was trained using aggregate data from both drivers. In such settings, we cannot really use uh, standard learning from comparison techniques because the car would have an accident while trying to uh, find a policy that's close enough to both drivers. This means we need to be able to handle multimodal rewards to learn successful policies. Although there have been many works for the unimodal reward functions, learning multimodal rewards from comparisons was not studied. Let me explain why multimodal rewards are more difficult with an example. Let's say we have this task where the Fed robot wants to learn how and which shelf to place the banana. Perhaps a user comes in and says they prefer the first trajectory, and Fed can handle this because it knows how to learn unimodal rewards. However, if a second user with different preferences shows up, then fetch will fail. In fact, it's doomed to fail. Let me explain why it's doomed to fail uh, with a numerical country example. So we have two trajectories, Xi1 and Xi2. This first user comes in, let's say the reward for the first trajectory is two and one for the second trajectory. Following the prior work, we model the user's comparison with the softmax model. So the probability that the user chooses a trajectory is proportional to the exponential of its reward. This model would give us these probabilities. Now, we also have the second user with different rewards and preferences. And let's say the first user provides 20% of the data and the second user provides 80%. Combining these, our robot would observe a data set that's 24% in favor of the first trajectory and 76% the second trajectory. Now, the problem is, I can come up with another pair of users whose rewards and preferences are different, such that with different data frequency, they also provide the same data. Our robot is only observing this data at the end. So from its perspective, these two settings are indistinguishable. It would have no way of identifying the underlying true rewards. In fact, researchers in ranking theory proved that you can always construct examples where learning multimodal or even bimodal rewards from pairwise comparisons is impossible. So are we done? Well, no, because we can think of some generalizations of the problem. Specifically, instead of learning from pairwise comparisons, let's say we will learn from rankings of multiple trajectories. 
So in this work, we are solving the problem of learning multimodal rewards using rankings. To reiterate, the robot is going to show multiple trajectories to the users, and it will ask them to rank these trajectories from best to the worst. We will have multiple users, each with their own reward function, parameterized by some omega, and the ranking query will be answered by one of these users with some unknown uh, pro probability parameterized by alpha. And the robot will not know who responded to the query. Finally, we will be given a set of trajectory rankings, and these rankings come from M humans, who may or may not have different preferences. And we want to learn the reward functions of these M humans. For this, we will first model how humans respond to these uh, ranking queries. In this example, let's say the first user is going to respond to this query. Our robot, however, doesn't know this. So how does the human answer? He will first basically select this best option. So we again have these probabilities that are proportional to the exponentials of the rewards. The user's top choice will be a random sample from this distribution. Next, he will noisily choose his second best option. Now, the first option has already been selected, so we drop that. And the user's second top choice will be a random sample from this remaining distribution. Similarly, the process will repeat for the third um, and, uh, and the fourth best option. This response model that I described for a single user is known as loose choice axiom, and it's a very standard model for rankings done by humans. Eventually, what our robot observes is only this ranking. It doesn't know which user gave this ranking. It doesn't even know the probability that this ranking uh, comes from this user. So from the robot's perspective, we have this user model. It doesn't know alpha, but it observed this ranking. It will start with a prior over both alpha and the user's reward functions. It will then use base rule to update its posterior based on the ranking it observed. Note that this likelihood term here is just the response model that I described. So we actually know everything on the right-hand side here. And our robot will perform this posterior update for all ranking data it has. At the end, it will learn all reward functions. In fact, it will even learn the data frequency parameter alpha. Let me show you some simulation results. On this fetch robot task uh, with the bimodal data, we observed that modeling the reward as a unimodal function failed terribly. There were many outliers because the robot was trying to come up with uh, one mode that explains all data. To get nicer graphs, we had to also plot the median error. On the other hand, modeling the reward as a multimodal function using our mixture model gave much better performance and learning, both in terms of mean and the median. The results were similar on OpenAI's Lunar Lander, where we again simulated a bimodal reward. One question that's still remaining is, how the robot chooses which trajectory to show to the users? For this, we developed an active querying method to increase data efficiency. How do we do this? In the unimodal case, this has been studied before. The idea is to maximize the mutual information between the reward and the user's response given the query. It's very similar in the multimodal case. We now need to maximize the mutual information for both the rewards and the data frequency parameter alpha. I'll skip the derivation, but this is the final optimization problem we ended up with. Here, all probability terms are easy to compute. They are just our response model. What is more tricky is these expectations because they require sampling from the distribution of alpha and rewards, which is multimodal. In the unimodal case, the most standard approach is to use metropolis testings for this sampling, but it's problematic in the multimodal case. For example, let's take this distribution with two modes. Metropolis testings would start with a random point and it would just remain around the mode that point is closest to. It wouldn't be able to discover the other mode in a reasonable amount of time. To handle multimodal distributions, we seem to run multiple chains of metropolis testings. So let's say we start with these three random points and then run three independent chains of metropolis testings. As long as we have enough chains with a good coverage of the distribution support, we will have samples around all modes. The only remaining part is how to solve the optimization problem. 
In the case of query-wise comparisons, looping over all possible queries might be feasible, but it's not here because queries consist of many trajectories now. Hence, we used simulated annealing to solve this problem. In the end, we compared this information gain based active learning with random queries and volume removal based active learning. We observed in simulations that it gives the best result on both the Fetch robot and the Lunar Lander tasks. Here, the top plots show mean squared error between the parameters of the learned and the true rewards. And the bottom plots show the predictive performance in terms of log likelihood on a validation set of rankings. In both metrics, the information gain based method increased data efficiency. When we look at the policies optimized with respect to the learned rewards, we again saw information gain outperformed random queries. And the difference is statistically significant with a paired sample t test. Finally, we designed an online interface to conduct some user studies. In this interface, multiple people provided anonymous ranking feedback to the robot by ranking six trajectories from best to the worst. Let's watch the end result after 10 random and 10 information gain optimized queries. As you can see, both robots learned the preference of the first user, but the robot who makes the random queries hasn't properly learned the second user's preferences yet. It still drops uh, objects out of the shelf, as you can see here. We also looked at quantitative measures, such as the predictive power of the learned multimodal rewards, just like in the simulations. In both the Fetch robot task and the Lunar Lander task, uh, the information optimized queries gave the best results. To summarize, we showed that ranking feedback allows us to learn multimodal rewards, and active query generation improves the data efficiency of learning. I want to finish with discussing some future work. First, there is still a gap in the identifiability bounds. We already know that in the unimodal case, pairwise comparisons are enough. Naturally, any size of ranking queries uh, would also be enough. In the bimodal case, we showed pairwise queries are not enough. They cannot identify the underlying rewards. In fact, even ranking queries of size 3 are not enough. One needs at least four trajectories in the queries. Things get tricky starting from the three model distributions. Here, Terry tells us ranking queries up to size 5 are not enough. It also tells us ranking queries of size 8 or more can identify the underlying rewards. But we don't know what happens in the region in between. And this gap gets larger as the number of modes increases. Another research direction is about the sampling methods. We use multiple chains of metropole settings, but there are other methods that can give better mixing guarantees. Finally, learning multimodal rewards from multiple sources of data is an interesting problem. Thank you, and I can take any questions. Thank you, Adam, for the wonderful talk. Uh, so for questions, let's, uh, let's first see if, uh, if the live audience uh, in person has any questions. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yes. Oh, no. oh nice. Looks like at the moment there are no questions, so you can go with the remote. We can talk. All right. So, uh, so maybe just to get started. Um, so, in this work, it, you assume that you have uh, a discrete modes, right? So, you have yes. like either a bi mode or a, a tri mode. So, there's a discrete number of modes. But um, have you also investigated? what happens if you if you do not have a discrete mode and instead a continuous uh, space of modes um so yeah we have we have discrete modes but uh the the like for each mode we can have different amounts of data um and i think for uh like in in, in practice that's enough and i'm not really sure how would we have uh, like how, how would we have like non-integer number of uh, modes? So. I see. So um, I guess an example is that if I just show you a user behavior, how do you select that M number of modes, right? So if I just give you a bunch of experience, 
how do you know um like a priori oh. what the number of modes are right 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 okay yeah that's a great question um so what we do is the the, the algorithm requires uh, uh, the algorithm requires to know m but it's actually very similar to like unsupervised learning. Like, it's similar to clustering. Like in clustering, you need to know the number of clusters, but what you can do is you can try different numbers and you can get an error curve to identify the like identify the trade-off. You, you can find a good balance uh, for the number of clusters. So it's very similar here. We can like you can start with only one mode and you'll probably get a high error rate if the underlying uh, data is not unimodal. So you then go to two modes and like eventually at some point your error is going to plateau. And then at that point you can say, oh, this is a good number of modes that I can assume and you can just use that. I see, I see. So in some sense you can keep incrementally increasing the number of modes and see at what point. Yes, exactly. um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, let's see. So, I, so uh, if there are no more questions, maybe we can, um, go on to the next presentation.